Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chairman and CEO of Honeywell International, Mr. David Cody. While President William Jefferson Clinton certainly doesn't need an introduction, I get to give him one anyway. And I'm very pleased to do so because the President has always been a steadfast supporter of business and the Exim Bank. He recognizes that American business and trade is the source of our nation's productivity and the source of our standard of living. That while it's important for government to be a regulator of business, it's just as important for government to be an enabler of business. That one of the best ways to build peaceful and prosperous relationships between nations is through commercial ties. That we live in a global interconnected economy. That our nation's ability to do good things domestically and internationally is derived from the strength of our economy. As president, this wasn't just an intellectual exercise, but rather an understanding that manifested itself in deeds. The 1993 economic package that brought us from deficits to surpluses in economic expansion. Providing financial loans to Mexico during their 1994 economic crisis. Help that the American public did not support by a five to one margin and put the president at significant political risk, especially if it didn't work. It saved Mexico and the loans were paid ahead of time. Completing nearly 300 trade agreements, including NAFTA, GATT, and securing PNTR, or Permanent Normal Trade Relationships, with China. Passage of the Jobs Through Trade Expansion Act in 1994 that supported the Overseas Private Investment Corporation and strengthened protection of intellectual property. Support of small business through the Small Business Job Protection Act, the Small Business Guaranteed Credit Enhancement Act, and the Small Business Lending Enforcement Act. And of great significance to the audience, support for numerous bills supporting the Exim Bank, most notably the Export-Import Bank Reauthorization Act of 1997. It's not a bad run there, Mr. President. And President Clinton's impact on the world hasn't stopped with the conclusion of his presidency. As examples, the establishment of the William J. Clinton Foundation with the intent to convert good intentions to good results by fostering partnerships between governments, businesses, NGOs, and private citizens. The Clinton Global Initiative, convincing global leaders to address the world's toughest issues. The Clinton Climate Initiative, working with 40 of the world's largest cities to reduce greenhouse gases. And raising money for disaster relief efforts around the world, partnering with President George H.W. Bush on several, and President George W. Bush on Haiti. In our own small way as a company, we've been able to support President Clinton in these efforts by mentoring 80 teachers in Mexico through the Clinton Global Initiative and distributing science kits to middle schools there. Strongly supporting the Clinton Climate Initiative with our focus on energy efficiency and rebuilding a 40,000 square foot school in Haiti. We're very proud of our association with you, Mr. President. So, when you have a president who demonstrated support for American business throughout his presidency, who has stayed hugely impactful on the world stage after his presidency, and who wants to continue helping American business and the American economy, what's a good way to make that happen? The answer, of course, is to give the keynote speech at the Exim Bank Annual Conference. So please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, President William J. Clinton. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very, very much. First, I want to thank Dave for the introduction. I, we have become an unlikely uh, group of friends, I guess, he and I. Small group, big guys. 
But Honeywell has been a terrific partner with the Clinton Clavin Initiative on energy efficiency projects with our global initiative because of what they've done on technology training in Mexico and China. And I really appreciate his services on the bipartisan budget committee. The president appointed him to the, what's become known as the Simpson Bowles Commission. And uh, their report seems to have been forgotten, but I hope maybe after the election it'll be dusted off because I think it's a, about the best framework for beginning our efforts in dealing with our long-term debt problem that I've seen. That's a free ad for Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles. Uh, but I, I want to thank the members of the Diplomatic Corps as well as the business people who are here. I understand Vice President Sambo of Nigeria is here. I welcome you. I, I love the country. I do a lot of work there. Um, I want to thank my friend Fred Hochberg, who I think has been a great president of the Exim Bank. Um, <laughs> Vice Chair Rhonda Felton, the board members, Pat Louie, Larry Walters, Sean Mulvaney, who are here, thank you very much. The, uh, <clears throat> this audience is full of people who once worked for me, and I hate to start mentioning them, but I can't. <laughs> I want to thank Kevin Varney, who was marshalling the XM people through the photo line in the back. He will always have a special place in my heart. He and his sister were both in my administration because he was so kind to my late stepfather who passed away a couple of years ago at 92. Uh, thank you, Tom McDonald, Tom O'Donnell, Tim Keating. Thank you very, very much for everything you did. Phil Kaplan, Orson Porter, all the others who are here who worked in the White House or in the administration. I'm saying this because support for the XM Bank used to be a bipartisan deal, and I hope it will be again. And I'd like to talk a little bit about this in the context of where the American economy is, not just where the reauthorization bill is. The President set a goal of doubling U.S. exports in five years. That can clearly be done. In the eight years I was President, we, dub we more than doubled exports, 168 percent increase. So that's almost 100 percent in five years. This can be done, but it has to be done with a strategy that includes a lot of things. And I want to kind of set this in some context. First of all, ever since the landmark study by the two NYU economists a couple of years ago, more and more people have noted that America's income stagnation problem may have a multiplicity of cures, but one of them is to have a higher percentage of our employment in the tradable sector of the economy. And I remember when I was pushing NAFTA and all those trade agreements and the creation of the World Trade Organization when I was president, it was obvious to me that we had to do that because export-related jobs then, I'm sorry I don't have the current figures, export-related jobs then on average paid 35 percent more than non-export-related jobs in the United States. I'm sure the numbers are more or less still the same. Uh, since President Obama took office, beginning with the NYU study, there have been a whole raft of studies that show that Americans who work in the tradable sector of the economy are likely not only get jobs with higher starting pay, but pay that increases with the growth of the companies. People who work in the non-tradable sector are much more likely to get jobs with not only lower starting pay, but without pay raises that keep up with inflation and economic growth. And I say that because most of the discussion here in Washington, and I participated in it, and I'm a Democrat, so you know what side I'm on on this, but a lot of this has is, is been about tax fairness and income inequality and the extraordinary gains of the last 
decade, in fact, the last 40 years, accruing to those of us who are in the top 1% or top one-tenth of 1% 1 of earners. I think that's an important debate. But wherever you come down on that, the most important thing is to keep growing the economy. If you don't grow the economy, it doesn't matter how you divide the shrinking pie. In the end, our hopes to build a country and, in fact, a world of shared prosperity will fail. So we should begin with that premise. And if America once again wants to lead the world towards shared prosperity, we have to be able to change the internal dynamics of growth in this country. And one key component of that must be to increase employment in the tradable sector, which means increase exports. Or in more common language <clears throat> that would be well appreciated in my native state of Arkansas, if you got 4% of the world's people and you want 20% of the world's income, you better sell something to somebody else. <laughs> so, I think this, so let me put the issue at hand today for the XM Bank, the reauthorization, what's the future of the bank, what should it be doing, in some sort of larger context. If we want this to work, we want to double exports in five years and then keep growing as a trading country and do it in a way that, way that it's fair to our trading partners and helps them to grow their economies and to generate employment for their people. Because if you really look all over the world, the thing that people are crying for everywhere in the world is a decent job with a reliable income that allows people to support their families. We have to start here with an economic policy that deals with our long-term fiscal challenges and still makes the necessary investments for a productive future. We had to produce competitive interest rates. They've been zero now, but when economic growth resumes vigorously, not just in America, but everywhere, interest rates will not stay as low as they are and won't remain competitive if we don't have a long-term plan to reduce our debt. We need enough regulation to avoid future financial crises, which include adequate capitalization requirements without choking off people's willingness to take risks. What happened in the last decade, and one of the reasons we didn't have much job growth and we had stagnant incomes in the United States is we had both way too much debt accumulation and too little investment in the areas where the jobs would grow, and we had insufficient oversight, which had so much uncertainty in the economy that the thing collapsed on us. So we need some balance there. The second thing we have to do is to have, as I said, adequate investment, including from the public sector, in the things that are important to our competitiveness, research and development, education and training. And we have to have investment in a modern infrastructure not only in our upgraded ports and airports and roads and water systems, but in the infrastructure of the 21st century, in a modern sustainable energy infrastructure and in information technology. These things are critical to our future. We also have to be prepared to reform our systems. Let me just back up and say, if you believe, as I do, that the major challenges of the world are basically subject to three categorizations. We're, there's too much inequality in income and access to employment and capital to start businesses and healthcare and education all over the world between rich and poor countries and within countries. There's too much instability for people to be willing to take risks with a reasonably predictable result. And the way we produce and consume energy and other resources locally has made our growth system unsustainable in the 21st century. We have to change that. 
the challenges of doing that are very different in rich and poor countries. I spend most of my time in places with very low incomes. We have AIDS operations where we either sell AIDS medicine or malaria medicine or tuberculosis medicine for people who also have AIDS or work on waterborne diseases, cholera, dysentery, diarrhea, or just simply build health systems and train people to do it in 70 countries. I do a lot of work in Haiti, as do several of you here, and some of you have helped me, and for that I'm grateful, and help the Haitians, for which I'm more grateful. In poor countries, they don't have the systems we take for granted in richer countries. I mean, just think of all the stuff we're sitting here taking for granted. You'd be shocked if the microphone failed, if the lights went out, if the screens went dark, for those of you like me who don't have 20-20 vision anymore. <laughs> you know you can drink the water. If you get bored with my speech, you can get up and go to the restroom. I spend a lot of my life in places where people can't take any of that for granted. We were in Malawi looking at one of our uh, reforestation and agricultural development projects a couple of years ago, it took us an hour and a half to go 18 kilometers on a road. Now it takes you an hour and a half to go 18 kilometers in DC today. <laughs> but for very different reasons. The point is, those places you have to build systems. Systems give predictable, positive consequences to good behavior. In all the old rich countries, which is basically the US, Europe, and Japan, we have systems. That's how we got rich. We have to reform them now. Because if you go all the way back to the Sumerian civilization, you see that all societies get long in the tooth. And the people running all great organizations, public and private, become more interested in holding on to present gains than creating future opportunities more interested in maintaining present positions of power than advancing the purposes for which the institutions were established in the first place. So we in America are in the process of trying to figure out how to reform our healthcare systems, our K through 12 education system, our system of financing and accessing higher education for people, and our energy systems. We need to be our finance systems and our government budgeting systems. We need to be reforming our immigration system, too. And I'll say a little more about that in the future. But the point is, you either, when you're a wealthy country that runs up against the limitations of the way you're doing business, you either reform and get back in the future business, or you don't. And if you don't, you get penalized. And that brings me to the export issue. One of the reasons we need to do a better job of our training programs is so we can get more workers into the tradable sector of the economy. One of the reasons we need more trade agreements is, you know, we take forever and a day to decide to approve one of these trade agreements, and meanwhile the people we're trying to make a deal with have made five other deals. And there's only so slow you can go in, until you make the perfect the enemy of the good. And that bothers me. Look what happened uh, with this Korea deal. And I applaud the approval of that and the Colombian trade agreement and the Panamanian one. But it took us five years to get this free trade agreement passed with Korea, during which time this rapidly growing country entered into agreements with the EU, Latin American countries, and others with a whole network of trading agreements that we then entered into. So we were following instead of leading. So I think that we have to see this XM issue in the context of that. If you want to be competitive, you have to be. It's just as simple as that. You have to do what it takes to make sure that Americans who are able to sell goods and services around the world have the chance to do so. I do not agree with those who say that our country is in permanent decline. 
It's still a highly entrepreneurial place and one of the easiest places to start a small business. We still have these hotbeds of innovation. Silicon Valley's booming again. High tech in Massachusetts is booming again. San Diego has the largest number of Nobel Prize winning scientists in America, and it's the center of our human genome research. Orlando, thanks to Disney World, Universal's theme park, Global Entertainment Arts Video Game Division, the Pentagon and NASA has 100 computer simulation companies. The Cleveland Clinic and the Cuyahoga Community College are helping to train the toughest of our long-term unemployed middle-aged, non-college educated people to work in emerging healthcare jobs that they never would have even entertained a few years ago. We have these innovation centers. They're important. Not only that, present company excluded, we're young compared to our long established competitors. Our workforce is younger than Europe's. It's younger than Japan's. Within 20 years, unless they change both their world ch one child policy and their immigration policy, we will be a younger workforce than China. And we could accelerate it if we'd stop some of our nutty immigration practices and let people who can create jobs for others come into this country. That's worth something. For those of us who no longer have it, we know youth is worth something. <laughs> And having the, the average age of the workforce be young, if they're well educated, if they're prepared, if they're well organized, if they're supported in a business government environment that works, is a very, very big deal. So we're still the largest exporters of goods and services and capital through remittances, but China and Germany do export more merchandise than we do now. And Germany, particularly, has a much higher percentage of its GDP in exports, partly because it is probably the most successful country in the world in involving small and medium-sized businesses in exporting, which is another reason that we should support Fred and the Exim Bank because of what they do there. Now, there are places where we've fallen behind. The quality of our infrastructure is no longer competitive. We rank 24th in the world in the computer download speeds off the internet, 24th. South Korea ranks first. Their download speeds are four times America's. We rank 15th or 16th in the world now in the percentage of our young adults getting university degrees, partly because of the way it's been priced out of the market. I do believe that uh, the student loan reform, which Congress passed and the President signed when fully implemented, will remedy part of that because it will allow all graduates to pay their loans back as a percentage of their income for up to 20 years. So that people can stop dropping out of college because they're afraid they can't pay the loan, and then they can pick jobs based on what they want to do and need to do, not based on the salary they have to have just to pay their loan back. But we have challenges, but we have advantages. Meanwhile, we got all these companies from big to small in America who are doing great things and have become far, far more productive as a result of the agonizing years we have all just endured. There was never a more important time for us to be competitive in the export markets. And while you can say all you want about, in theory, subsidizing the financing of exports distorts the free market, as a practical matter, when you get on a field in a competition, you either meet the competition or you get beat. I have never been big on unilateral disarmament. I love mutual agreements. And I'd love it if we'd all get rid of our nuclear weapons. I'd love it if a lot of wonderful good things that happened could happen by mutual and verifiable agreement. But unilateral disarmament is not a very good recipe for success in athletic or economic competition. So I hope that in the end, this question of the XM Bank's reauthorization 
will not be a political football. It was one thing, even the harshest of times of partisan disagreements when I was president, that I don't believe we ever had a fight over. No matter what else we were fighting about, I don't think there was ever any disagreement about it. And I think it's important. I also remember that we made an extraordinary effort, partly through Fred's leadership at the SBA, to harmonize the SBA programs with the XM Bank program so we could get more small business people in it. When we reauthorized the SBA, we said the export loan program would work like that of the XM Bank, so we, in effect, made the XM Bank financing bigger. By mid-1997, we had a national export strategy that was focused on medium-sized and smaller companies. And we eased the lending for them through the Working Capital Guarantee Program of the XM Bank. We created an export assistance system that was nationwide. And between 93 and 97, we more than doubled the export sales that it facilitated. We had an exporter database, direct marketing, that by 2000, we had 127,000 companies which were used to find almost 30,000 new customers. We did a lot of this kind of work. And I was thrilled when President Obama nominated Fred Hochberg because he'd been at the SBA. So I knew that we would try to help the big companies, but they would come to us with what the deal was, and it would be fairly straightforward. We'd either do it or not, but we didn't have to do a lot of work. What we had to do is to make sure that the medium and smaller companies that could and should be in exporting would be involved in that. So yes, 80% of the XM Bank's financing by dollar volume goes to larger enterprises like Boeing or Caterpillar or GE, but the financing for smaller exporters has nearly doubled over the last three years. More than 85% of the transactions are done by the XM banks, and that's very important because one of the reasons that this kind of work is not so attractive for private banks are the transaction costs involved in the smaller operations. This can make a huge difference. We had a 300% increase in the dollar value of exports by small business in the 90s. We can do that again on a bigger base if we reauthorize the XM Bank. And so I just want to emphasize this is not just about big companies with well-known addresses. Wichita and Toledo have more than 15% of their annual GDP tied to exports. And there are a lot of other towns doing so as well. Increasingly, state economic development programs are trying to get into this. North Carolina has a particularly aggressive effort through its Department of Commerce to organize and involve their small businesses in exporting. But there's no mechanism through which what they do can be readily spread to other states unless you have the infrastructure of the XM Bank out there working state after state after state after state, trying to make sure that everybody knows how to do this and what the consequences are. So again, I would say we live in a world where everybody's looking for an advantage, and yet everybody knows we need rules to keep the advantages from running into excess. So we have the World Trade Organization, then we have a heck of a lot of fights over whether this or that or the other practice violates the WTO rules. And this is the world we live in, a dynamic, vibrant world. All I know is this. Although successful countries around the world, as defined by growing economies, creating jobs, rising incomes, have different political systems, and a variety of different economic and social systems. Every successful country, every single one, has both a strong economy and an effective government. 
and they work out some deal appropriate to the circumstances that exist to make themselves as competitive as they can possibly be. You cannot cite a single country on the planet that has both a growing economy, that has a growing economy, rising incomes, and a robust sense of the future that does not have For more than a decade, have probably the highest rates. Haiti has the highest electric rates in the Caribbean, the poorest country. Virtually every Caribbean country could be completely energy dependent with solar, wind, geothermal, and waste to energy facilities. They could run all their cars on biofuels run, made in the Brazilian system, where you get with sugarcane, 9.3 gallons of fuel for every gallon of oil required to produce it. It would change the future of the Caribbean, our neighbors, our friends, our partners, and it could be led by American technology and American companies if we could work the financing out. 
It's one of the things I plan to spend a lot of time on in the next 10 years. But it's just one example. If we want to do this, given their economic circumstances, even the American jurisdictions in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, if we're going to do this, we got to work the financing. And I could give you 50 other examples. So for those of you who are here from America, whether you're Republicans, Democrats, or Independents, I urge you to ask the Congress to reauthorize this bank at the higher level. For those of you from other countries, I urge you to continue to work to build the kind of trading and investing relationships with us that will give us a chance to do things that every good market does, that benefit our people but also benefit yours, and help you to build modern, diverse economies where we share the prosperity and the responsibility of a 21st century world so full of opportunities and challenges. I do not think you should be pessimistic, but I do think we should say, let's just get off the dime. Let's quit majoring in the minors. Let's quit fighting about things that are self-evident. And let's decide that our goal is to create opportunity societies for people and to take those steps which will do it and do it most quickly, most effectively, and most broadly. There'll still be plenty of room for honest argument about how to do that. But a lot of very simple decisions will be resolved in a rapid way, beginning with reauthorizing the XM Bank. Thank you very much. We're going to have a break. We'll be back at 12.30 with lunch. See you then.
And the good thing about your how far is that you take it for that, that you know, how far is working, you have to work like that.